And with everything else going on today, you are here. Thank you for being here for our, um, as, as the um, conversation has unfolded these last uh, couple of weeks in this week in preparation for our conversation today, uh, Mike and Kelly and I in conversation have realized we need more than one session on artificial intelligence. So um, I and Dr. Jensen will not be here, so I can set you straight on that day. We are going to eat again. I'm kidding about saying this. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh. Um, <laughs> on June 4th. So we'll meet today, and then again on Sunday, June 4th, we'll have a second time around. And uh, most of our presentation, or our conversation today, will be presentation. Kind of lay some groundwork with some time for conversation at the end. And then we'll have a more open conversation um, following up on some of our conversation today on June 4th, on that Sunday. Uh, and who knows, by June 4th it may be entirely different terrain, right? Uh, given how quickly things are developing, you've been watching any of the uh, press coverage and conversation and the realities of artificial intelligence or so-called artificial intelligence in the last few days. Uh, we are grateful to have with us uh, Dr. Kyle Jensen, who is well known in the Bark Center and in the church, all of his family. Uh, Kyle is Professor of English and Director of the Writing Program at Arizona State University. He is also, as he may explain, deeply involved in the very development of artificial intelligence around writing and other things of great interest. He can tell you more about that work, so he knows more than I do. Um, but I still have, 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 have his have more opinion than he does. <laughs> no, we're so grateful to have Kyle here. Kyle's going to give a presentation and some conversation, laying some groundwork. Uh, we are sort of artificially counterpointing each other today. I have enormous respect for Kyle. And I don't, I don't even know what he's going to say, but I'm going to listen and I'm going to, uh, to respond and lay out some ideas um, about some, some of the things that have been happening most recently around this and uh, potential implications for religious life. And then we'll have some conversation and follow up on June 4th. Carl Jensen. Good morning. How are you? I want to tell this up since he's a little shorter. <laughs> I got to give him a hard time. He decided that he was not going to announce his resignation the one Sunday that I was not here because I was sick. I had to leave. And so when they asked me if I would be willing to host this courageous conversation, I said, sure, let's debate. And whoever wins, uh, if I win, then Wes will have to stay on longer and continue to have these kinds of rhetorical dialogues. We were just walking through the hall. He said, how are we going to decide who wins? I told him that I was deciding who won. So congratulations, Wes. You just signed up for a little bit longer time here at Pinnacle Presbyterian. Um, as Wes said, uh, my name is Kyle Jensen. I'm a professor of English. Uh, and you may be sitting there wondering, well, what on earth is a professor of English doing talking about artificial intelligence? Um, shouldn't there be a computer programmer here? Shouldn't there be a computer engineer? And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't really know how to answer that question effectively. What I can tell you from a background perspective is that I've been writing about artificial intelligence as it relates to automated writing for the better part of six or seven years. And one of the things that people consistently ask me is, what do you think about this new thing? Uh, this, these large language models that are auto-generating a lot of text and you know, stirring up a ruckus. And one of the things I say is, um, they're not altogether that new. They are new in terms of their speed and scale. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that this morning. But the appeal to create auto-generated writing text has been something that's appeared throughout the history of writing. And that's an important place to begin, because one of the things that I'm going to stress in my talk this morning is the importance of developing historical literacy with regard to artificial intelligence. It is very easy for us to become kind of caught up and embroiled in the debates about, for example, will intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence transform religion? Will machines soon take over labor practices? And, and the like. Um, I want to provide a little bit of a framework so that you can answer, provide answers to those questions thoughtfully, so that when they're raised to you, you can have a courageous conversation rather than a kind of polemical conversation. Um, and then, as I understand, there will be follow-up uh, conversations. Wes has uh, conveniently chosen for me to be out of the country. When the next one will occur, uh, I'll follow up, I'll watch 
watch the recording and I'll set whatever he gets. We'll right? do it again. Yeah, we'll do it again. Okay, so God and Robots, Will Artificial tra uh, Intelligence Transform Religion? The answer to this question is, I, we don't know. Um, one of the things that we do know is that uh, technologies, whether they're artificial, uh, whether they're related to artificial intelligence or printing presses or the distri distribution of audio across time and space, has an impact on how we deliver the message of Christ. But to what extent it transforms religion will largely depend on how well the church develops what I'm going to call later artificial intelligence literacy. And so my challenge to you this morning is to, if you're serious about this conversation and you're serious about this research, to start getting active as researchers. We need to use the minds uh, and the hearts that God has given us so that we can learn to educate ourselves and one another on this particularly important topic. Because one of the things that I'm absolutely certain of, uh, and I was in a, in a meeting where Bill Gates confirmed this, uh, this uh, insight pretty in, in kind of straightforward uh, in a very straightforward claim, is that this technology will continue to develop at an exponential rate. It will alter how we communicate with digital computers. And if it alters how we uh, engage with one another through digital computing, it will affect life outside of that as well. So if that's not a strong enough impetus for you to want to learn more about it, then you're probably in the wrong spot. Okay. One of the things that my dissertation advisor would always do on a day-to-day -day basis whenever I met with him, I handed him my writing like, this is the chapter. This is the one, this is the draft, you're gonna really like this one. He would always look at me, up at me perplexed and he'd say, what problem are we trying to solve here today? His name was Ron Fortune and I like to tell people that because uh, I have spent the better part of 14 years since graduating from Illinois State University uh, talking with him an hour every week. Um, and his name is Act. Um, the opportunity to talk with someone who patiently identifies the stakes of a particular issue and uses that framework to understand what is, it we're, what is the problem that we're defining and what is the outcome we're trying to achieve has altered how I think about intellectual work. And intellectual work is something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I want everybody in here to get in the habit of asking themselves the question, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? Because the, if, we, if we define the problem in a particular way, let's say the problem is we want to prevent artificial intelligence from in, uh, changing the way we do business at the church, that's going to have a direct effect on how we define what artificial intelligence is. In that particular instance, it's going to be deemed as a threat. And it's going to create a series of expectations about how we interact with it. Is it something to be avoided? Is it something to be safeguarded against? We can kind of go down the line, the tropological line, and try to figure out from a metaphorical standpoint, like how do we orient ourselves toward this particular issue? But there's a really important, um, it is incredibly important for us to step back and ask the question from an open stance, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And to entertain the possibility that people have different perspectives on this issue that might not fully align with how we want to define the issue. Now, why does that matter? Well, I'm a rhetorician, and so is Wes, and, that, and one of the things that is characteristic of rhetorical studies more generally is that we have to negotiate perspectives that are different than our own, because when we encounter and consider perspectives that are different than our own, we increase the probability that we will have a solution that benefits as many people as possible. Does that make sense? So, what problem are we trying to solve? <clears throat> One of the most helpful tools, this is my, I, I, I don't know, I, I sometimes worry that uh, I'm not particularly engaging uh, as a speaker, so I put these cute little robots behind me in case I get warm. Uh, one of the tools of rhetorical theory is an invention that Aristotle and then later Hermogoras uh, proposed. It's called stasis theory. And this you walk, don't, if you're here and you're like, I don't really want to talk about artificial intelligence, stasis theory is actually uh, topic agnostic. It's something that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis. I often use it when I'm deliberating with my 8 and 10-year-old daughters, whom you've probably seen bouncing around. They're the lollipop kids, big heads, blonde hair type of thing. Um, and one of the things that we always try to do 
is we try to be systematic in how we define a particular problem. So stasis theory is the claim that in order to define and solve any problem, you have to move through these four areas of consideration. So I'm going to help you define these here in a moment. The question of conjecture. And we have to always begin any kind of problem definition with the question of conjecture. Does the thing actually exist? If we can't agree on an issue, on the existence of a particular issue, then there's no point in trying to define it. And there's no point in trying to differentiate the qualities associated with that definition. And there's certainly no point in trying to decide what to do from a policy standpoint. What do we do about it? We have to agree that it exists. If, for example, you encounter somebody and you say, I believe that God exists, and that person says, I don't, there's nowhere to go from there. You could try to persuade, like, I could say to Mike, uh, well, here are all the reasons why you should believe that God exists. And that person will say, but I don't believe that God exists. You see my point here? So, can we generally agree that a phenomenon like artificial intelligence exists? I think so. Yeah. It's not something that's made up, it's, you know, it's, it's something that we can actually see, feel, we can engage with uh, from a, and negotiate from a different kind of standpoint. Okay, cool. So then the question becomes, what is it? What is artificial intelligence? And when we begin to ask and try to answer that question, I want to stress again the importance of collecting complicated and sometimes divergent perspectives that move past our own range of acceptability. It's very easy. I've been spending a lot of time lately reading about confirmation bias, reading behavioral psychology and organizational psychology, in part because one of the problems that I'm trying to understand as a researcher is what are the barriers to listening to perspectives that are different than our own? And I don't think that it's any surprise, given the situation that we found ourselves in, that we need to solve the problem of intractability. I think this way, you think this way, we can either bang heads or go in opposite directions. That doesn't always lead to particularly positive outcomes more often in the history, in the human history, it often leads to violence. So as a scholar, what I'm trying to figure out is how do we increase the probability of helping someone listen to a perspective that is different than our own? So the question of definition, what is it, necessarily requires you to collect perspectives that, have, that are different by nature. Why frame it this way? Because it is incredibly tempting in our attention economy to grab on to definitions of artificial intelligence that articulate with what we already worry, fear, are anxious about, whatever the case may be. I'm going to explain why that's a case here and why that's a case a little bit later on and how it kind of connects with labor history more generally. Um, but my, my greatest concern as a member of this church, as a member of the broader Christian community as a whole, is that we are going to become caught in the rhythm of the attention economy that says over and over and over again, this is a threat, we need to sign a petition to slow down its development. All of these folks are resigning. Tomas asked me about this just a moment ago. Um, the, you know, one of the lead developers at Google is, is pulling away and drawing attention. Uh, to the need to be much more careful and cautious about it. One of the things I want you to not hear me say in making that claim is that we shouldn't slow down artificial intelligence research. I actually think that's a really good idea. But the difference maybe between my perspective and your perspective is I've spent time with artificial intelligence engineers. I've spent a lot of time studying, writing, and researching about writing, uh, about the relationship between writing and artificial intelligence. I've listened to perspectives that say, actually, artificial general intelligence is not even as close as most prognosticators fear, and read researchers that have said, actually, it's a lot closer. I've looked at the engineering, and it's moving at an incredibly quick, quick clip. We need to be patient and understand, and we need to be meticulous and patient and try to understand where it's going and why it's headed in that particular direction, but we can't do that if we simply accept the definition that confirms our worst fears. That makes sense, everyone? Okay. And then once we do that, once we arrive at a definition, we can start asking about its characteristics. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you 
some quality, some very specific characteristic qualities of one type of artificial intelligence, the type that you're reading about most consistently uh, in the media, large language models and generative AI. Okay? But one of the things that you need to realize is that with the definition of artificial intelligence, a lot gets joined together and it's kind of amorphous for many people. Uh, there are there's all sorts of artificial intelligence. How many of you have a smartphone with you today? Oh, cool. So you guys are already, already hanging out with a lot of artificial intelligence. Anyway, I'll show you how you're doing that in a moment. Um, but we're going to talk about specific kind of characteristics. I'm a professor at ASU, and one of the things that I do every single day is I walk to Jimmy John's and I order a sandwich because I don't like tracking lunch when I'm trying to get everything else done. And I walk alongside these little mini lunch delivery robots. They're super cute. They're a little bit like some of the robots that I put in this presentation today. And I watch them interact and they have these really hypersensitive sensors that you know, try to ensure that they don't run into anything. And yet somehow I always stumble over them. That's a form of artificial intelligence. A Roomba is a form of artificial intelligence. We're not going to talk about vacuums or food delivery mechanisms today. Sorry, so if you came here for that, I apologize. <laughs> uh, it's very disappointing. And the other thing that we want to do is we want to ask the question, once we agree that it exists, once we agree upon a definition, once we develop an expansive uh, list of characteristic traits, then we start asking, okay, given all that, now what do we do? Here's the problem. Most public debates that we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis say, does it exist? Yep. Okay, what do we do about it? And what that does is it short circuits the deliberation process. It makes us sound like we know more about a particular phenomenon than we actually do. And it would be more accurate to say, I am familiar with how people talk about that issue than it would be to say that I actually know something about artificial intelligence and can make thoughtful recommendations on how we should proceed given my study. Does that make sense? We need to go from the place where we're saying, I am familiar because I've heard how people talk about artificial intelligence, to I have something thoughtful to say in light of the fact that I've studied artificial intelligence. The stakes are too high to be familiar with what other people say. So if there's something to be concerned about, I'm actually much more concerned about our, the way we talk about artificial intelligence than I am artificial intelligence itself. And the good news for us is that's a human heart issue. That's an industry issue. We can work our way into that space, a space of thoughtfulness, a space of patient deliberation. You don't have to have a degree in computer science to find yourself in a, in a position of thoughtfulness. And we can all work together in order to accomplish that task. And in fact, we ought to. Okay, so stasis theory is done. You got your rhetorical lesson for the day. By the way, if you're ever in an argument, this is a pretty handy tool. If Donna and Tomas are arguing about, you know, who had more cookies that particular, does it exist? If you can't agree that Tomas ate more cookies, then we can't go to definition. And then, but you see my point here? We need, to, we need to get in the habit of systematically defining terms so that we can negotiate them more successfully. If you take nothing away from this talk, please take that away. So what is artificial intelligence? I got asked this question on Friday. Uh, I think people assign a lot more knowledge to, the, to me in this topic than I actually know about. I began by saying I'm not a computer scientist. In fact, there's a lot to be said and underscored about that particular issue. I, I think there's, um, what would I say? Um, I, people who know me know that I like to barbecue. Yeah, I lived in Texas for 10 years. And one of the things that I learned how to do to get involved in the culture is I started eating like the Texans. It's a really wonderful thing. Um, it's a really kind of community oriented thing. And I have a really good friend who also does that. Um, he likes to go around and do little barbecue tours, and one of the things he says to me um, pretty consistently is, you know barbecue better than I do because you've done the work of learning how to make barbecue yourself. I'm just a fan. Does that make sense? <laughs> and the same is true in this particular instance. I am a scholar. I do study how arguments are formed and how they circulate in public. 
I do have a pretty extensive knowledge of the history of writing, but I'm not a computer engineer. And in order for me to be more than a fan of artificial intelligence, or maybe just a kind of concerned bystander, I would have to do the work, and I'm in the process of doing that. So check in with me about six months, and I may have more intelligent things to say. But the important thing to note here, what is, is artificial intelligence? We actually need multiple definitions in order to answer that question effectively. So I'm not going to give you a particular definition because I think the technology is evolving in such a way that we can say, well, it's not human intelligence and it has these certain kinds of characteristics, but we're defining it almost exclusively in the negative. And we don't have a historical basis of knowledge. We can't really answer that thoughtfully because what artificial intelligence was in the 1980s is very different than how it is now. Does that make sense? So, what are we going to focus on? Let's see. We're going to talk about generative AI and large language models. Okay. I asked you earlier if you had a cell phone. Can you pull your cell phone down? All right, you have messaging? Yes? Okay, just try and start typing a message for me. You can just like pick a person, you can send a, a really nice note to Wes saying, I like the way you look today or something. <laughs> send, send Wes or Mike a sweet note. Okay. One of the things that should happen as you're starting to type is that the message app will start to make suggestions about what you should say. How many people have already experienced that? It's cool, right? No, it's not cool. Why isn't it cool? Tell me what happens. Because I have really strange words inserted in Isn't that weird? Yes. How many of you have written an awkward note to somebody that you realize only after hitting send, you're like, what did you just say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, lost her mind. If I'm not a pastor, it says something a little bit different than that. <laughs> yeah. So, autocorrect is a function that you're very familiar with, right? Why does it break down? Why doesn't autocorrect work all the time? You would think, well, surely, after all this time, after all the text that I've sent, that this software would be able to reliably predict what I want to say. And yet it doesn't. The reason why is because, statistically speaking, it's not using a language model that is big enough. And the reason why I asked you to look at that particular software is because that's a small-scale version of essentially what generative AI is doing. The difference is, is that instead of having, you know, just getting by enough for you to send a text, it is working from a large language model that has the capacity to generate pages and pages and pages of content to reliably take a test, to make a recommendation on recipes that incorporate meatloaf more effectively, or whatever the case may be. So I want you to think, every time you think about a large language model, I want you to think about your, the autocorrect, and just think of it as a scaled up version of autocorrect. So the next question would have to be, well, how big is the scale, Kyle? Well, the company that I work with has a large language model that is based on 178 billion textual brands. 178 billion, with B, textual parameters. Now, why would they want to have that many textual parameters? Well, if they develop an algorithm or a series of algorithms that are analyzing statistically what word should appear next in the line, and they want to do so successfully, more is better. They're the Costco of words, right? You need one packet of ramen, they're like, no, we'll give you 73 to go with that one. And yes, it will sit there and probably not be used, but what it's doing is it's crawling all of that data so that it can reliably anticipate what it is you want to see. Does that make sense? Starting to make, it's starting to seem less scary, maybe? Well, let's make it more scary. Okay? And then I'll bring it back to less scary. Um, the computational power for these large language models is such that very few people can reliably afford to build them. They require a ton of processing and a ton of, mem a ton of memory. In fact, you know, when I meet with um, the company that I help consult with, one of the things they say is there's only about 10 or 12 companies in the world that 
that actually have built a large language model that is strong enough and powerful enough to do this work without causing obvious alarm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what do you think those companies are? Google. Google. Microsoft. Microsoft, Meta, OpenAI, Amazon, so on. Right? So they have all these, and in fact, Amazon contracts with the company that I consult with. It's pretty cool. So then you ask yourself the question, okay, if there's this technology that's being released to the public, and it's stoking all sorts of public concerns, and it's getting billions of dollars dumped into it, but it's going to a very concentrated area, and very few people have, or very, uh, very many people have opinions on where it should go, but very few people understand how it works you can start to see a kind of fundamental shift in how knowledge production and dissemination occurs. Does that make sense? That's the thing I want you to be afraid of. Can I ask you an example? What? Uh, he asked for an example. Yeah. Yeah. So, these large language models, if they don't have any regulations placed over them, have the capacity to generate and distribute texts about anything ad infinitum in a, in a set. The calculation power is so strong. You're basically talking about the capacity to control media and, the, how, and circulate how people think or what they seem to think as, is possibly perceived as <coughs> One of the things we know about rhetoric, this is, a, this is a rhetoric lesson, is that repetition is incredibly powerful. It's an incredibly powerful persuasive device. If you hear things repeated over and over again, you are highly likely to think that it, is, there's, it has some grounding in reality. My favorite rhetorician, Kenneth Burke, who I write about pretty consistently, wrote this essay called The Rhetoric of Hitler's Battle, where they said, well, what, what made this guy so persuasive is the consistency of the repetition. As such, it starts to become reality. And so this tool, has the capacity to generate, auto-generate, and dis disseminate any message about any topic, whether or not it's rooted in reality. And if we don't understand how it works, and if only a handful of companies own the rights to that, <laughs> then it becomes a public policy issue. Does that make sense, Mark? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of the weird news. Um, Right after, um, I've been paying obviously pretty close attention to the development of artificial intelligence technologies because when I was actually on my way to Tel Aviv to go work with this company, uh, ChatGPT was released and then they had a bunch of meetings about it and trying to figure out um, what to do from a practical perspective. And then shortly thereafter, Microsoft dumped $10 billion into OpenAI as an investment. It's amazing, right? Here's one of the things that's particularly peculiar about it, and this is maybe a, a way that we can start pulling back and thinking about the commercial viability of large language models. Why would a company like Microsoft invest $10 billion in a technology like ChatGPT and then integrate it into its search function in particular? Like, why would they integrate large language modeling into search? Any ideas? search market. I'm sorry? They want to dominate the market. They, don't, they want to dominate the market. Beat Google. They want to beat Google. How does Google make money? <coughs> Ads. Advertising dollars. So if you can create a chatbot that learns about your purchasing tendencies and has a conversation with you and says, oh, I don't even think you realize that this particular product might be really suited given your purchase history and instead of it just being some awkward ad on the like, margins of the Facebook splash page, right? It's actually talking with you and interfacing with you. It seems like it's making personal recommendations and knows something more about you. And given the extreme isolation that social media has caused, we can start to see why that would be an enticing market technology. Does that make sense? So these are the things you need to, the thing you need to understand is the function of having a large language model primarily is to create chatbots that interact with us and that create hyper-personalized uh, communications that are specific to your particular needs, interests, whatever. And draw conclusions about you? Yeah. We see from your purchases, 
it, uh, Mr. You must have uh, a certain disease. Yeah. Or something. Is that correct? Yeah, my disease is being too tall and talkative. And I can tell. <laughs> that's, uh, that's exactly right. <laughs> Does that make sense? So that's what we're looking at on the horizon. That that force goes so far. We're going to start to see that. We're going to see a kind of. Uh, I would wager. I'm just being predictive here, and you know, sensitive to being recorded, and maybe someone will um, say, uh, "Yeah, you were way off." Um, but it seems to me highly probable that Microsoft and Google are going to go at it to see which can develop the more hyper-personalized search tool. And that's going to have direct implications on how we purchase, interface with technology, and interface with one another. And I think some of the things I've actually seen recently is that to add to that hyper-personalization is that they can create a, hum a very human-looking face yeah, I've seen that, that will, with language, with, uh, with voice skills, I mean, with voice that approximates, it looks like you're talking very soon. Yes. I think these search engines are going to, it looks like you're talking to a human being when yeah. you're doing these things. Yeah. So, I mean, that's good. I didn't think about that hyper-personalization as being part of that. Yeah. You need to, to, to create that kind yeah, of... Yeah, in, in any kind of language you want it to be yes. in as well. Yeah. So, yeah, the question of deep fakes and, and the like are really concerning. Hmm. Yeah. So you're saying that, I mean, we already see that. So I, I look at Tile on the computer, and all of a sudden on Facebook, all of a sudden I'm getting our advertisements for Tile. So you're saying that not only is that going to happen, that somebody is going to be telling me what to buy. I don't so think it's going to be saying? somebody. I think it's better to I say something. 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 Okay, a, something that is maybe acting as somebody. Right. Okay. It's, it seems to be that that's a that's logical. What she's that's a logical outcome of okay. the technology okay. itself. And the idea here is that large language modeling um, is fluent mm -hmm. for the most part, except it's not. Okay. And when it's not, we have to start being very fastidious about how we think about human communication. When I was at, I was at the Arizona State uh, Global Silicon Valley Conference a couple of weeks ago and meeting with uh, developers who were involved at Google and Microsoft with ChatGPT and, and Bart and Bart Technologies. And one of the things that they said really consistently, I think I'm probably like moving way ahead here, but let's see. <coughs> Oops. Oh, I'll get that. I'll get to that in a minute. You can look at this cute little robot here while I'm talking. One of the things that they said really consistently is that their concern, one of the major concerns publicly is that um, ChatGPT and other large language model, generative AI models, will do something called hallucinating, meaning it will invent fiction and then be convinced that it is telling the truth. Um, we need to pause on that for a moment and not assign anthropomorphic qualities to a statistical algorithm. It is not convinced of anything. It's just simply producing the most statistically probable thing given what preceded it. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So it is. It, it, it doesn't have sentience. Yeah. It is not aware of itself. It has processing power. It has scale and scope. It has memory that Process things way faster than human beings can. But it is not aware of itself, even when it sounds like it's aware of itself. It just simply means that if we were to ask it, what do you think about this? The most highly probable thing to respond, <coughs> given what has been written and given the database that it's crawling, is to say, I think this X, Y, or Z. Does that make sense? No, it's not thinking. So what do you say? It's like linear thinking? It's process. It's processual. Yeah, it's, it, it's really, like, go back to that autocorrect thing and say the most probable thing it will introduce in, in, in the case of, like, the texting, it, it will say, or, <coughs> no, it's with large language modeling and generative AI, you'd be like, sure, that makes sense. So, from a, a, a scholar of rhetoric and a language scholar's perspective, one of the things that I consistently want to raise my hand uh, and ask these engineers is, why do you think hallucination in language is a problem that can be solved? Because that's not peculiar to large language modeling. In fact, one of my, my, you remember Ron Fortune, my dissertation advisor? Uh, at the end of his career, he was studying literary forgeries. 
things that were designed with the express purpose to deceive, as not being, as seeming as if it were written by the hand of, let's say, Shakespeare, and doing such a convincing job that they were selling as authentic texts, but in fact, were not rooted in reality. There are tons of ways that language does this on a day-to-day -day basis. Anybody in here ever told a lie? Does that not constitute a hallucination? Really believed it. And then later on, he's like, wow, given what I know now, that's actually not consistent with the reality that I currently live in. Does that make sense? In other words, hallucination is a fundamental problem of human humanity's interaction with alphabetic technologies, so words and sentences and paragraphs and writing. Large language modeling just calls that into clear relief. And what we're doing is we're making a sleight of hand when we're saying it's the technology that's hallucinating. It's language that's hallucinating. Does that make sense to everyone? And that's the problem we should be concerned about. That has the biggest impact on how we think about the relationship between words and God. Don't believe me? Think about how many faiths you would say create a reality that are inconsistent with what you believe to be true that are antagonistic to, or antithetical, to what you believe to be true. Was that ChatGPT's fault? Or was that language's fault? Does that make sense? So a lot of the issues that we're dealing with, with regard to ChatGPT, is just an exacerbation of long-standing problems that are associated with humanity. You can see this in the articles that are written in the New York Times, where they will say something to the effect of, uh, large language modeling uh, and chat GPT will create an end of democracy. And the question is why? People will use them to do this thing. The problem is not the technology, the problem is the people. It's still a human problem. And it's a problem that we, as believers, care a lot about. Not because we want to accumulate them, but because we want to help people find the path toward grace and forgiveness. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what's the difference? The, I want you to look at this cute little robot and then look at the difference between these letters. There's a difference between AI and AGI. Has anybody ever heard of that distinction before? No? Good. I'm going to teach you something today. That's great. So, AI is the general category for all sorts of technologies associated with com basically computers that seem to have knowledge or that produce things that are knowledgeable. Okay? AGI is Artificial General Intelligence. Artificial in general intelligence is the thing that, that computer engineers want to create so that artificial intelligence technologies can seem like they're human or can have human -like properties. No one has developed artificial general intelligence yet. And depending on who you ask, it's not possible given the existing parameters. I'll show you um, some quotes on this particular in a moment. A lot of the projections about what will happen in the future will largely depend on whether or not AGI is even possible with computing technologies. I don't know, again, I'm not a computer engineer, I'm a language scholar, but what I do think is that the possibility of AGI increases proportionally with quantum computing versus digital computing. The reason why is because you have multiple things holding, in quantum computing, something can be both A and not A simultaneously. How you doing? Does that make sense? In digital computing, you can only have ones and zeros, which makes things incredibly linear. Does that make sense? So they're statistically very powerful, but they don't deal with ambiguity very well. Whether or not that happens remains to be seen, but I've heard other smarter people on this topic uh, talking with regard to this topic saying the following, that when it comes to the AGI, it's both a hardware and a software problem. Right now, in the media, we're only thinking about it in terms of a, of a software problem. Does that make sense? So there's all sorts of processing, there's all sorts of theoretical research that I'm not qualified to explain better than I just did right there. Um, but ambiguity is, is going to be the key to solving the hardware. Okay, so let's learn a little bit about AGI. 
Michael Bouldridge is a computer scientist and has been working on artificial intelligence for a really long time. He's got a book called Brief History of Artificial Intelligence uh, that's really accessible for uh, public audience. And I'll put together a list of readings that I might recommend um, if you want to learn more about this. But he says basically this. AGI roughly equates to having a computer that has the full range of intellectual capabilities that a person has. This would include the ability to converse in natural language, solve problems, uh, reason, perceive its environment. I forgot a comma there. Uh, that was, I had chat GPT out of generated, so that's a I'll take responsibility. I missed the comma. And so on, at or above the same level as a typical person. So what you might be saying is, well, seems like ChatGPT is doing all of those things, and yet if you ask if the ChatGPT as a statistical processor, it can sound like it has an awareness and apply general rules across, across different contexts, but it can't. It's not aware of itself. And I think that's the key differentiation between artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence. We are aware of ourselves. <coughs> that makes sense. Okay? Don't believe, don't like Michael's quote? Let's read Jeff Hawkins, who's a much, uh, much more bullish on the possibility of uh, developing AGI. Deep learning networks, large language models, work well, but not because they solve the knowledge representation problem. So knowledge rep representation you need to say, I am aware that I have created knowledge and I can think about how, in the process of creating that knowledge, I have done something for myself and something for knowledge. They work well because they avoided it completely, relying on statistics and lots of data instead. How deep learning networks uh, work is clever. Their performance is impressive and they are commercially valuable. I'm only pointing out that they don't possess knowledge and therefore are not on the path of having the ability of a five-year-old child. So this is a person who is actively studying human uh, he's, a, he's a neuroscientist and is actively studying how human brains work with the goal of developing um, artificial general intelligence. And what he's saying pretty clearly in this passage is that the fundamental construction of large language models and generative AI will not be to artificial general intelligence. So if you're worried that the path we're currently on will likely lead to you know, the extinction of humanity, I don't, you can listen to the specialist, I'm not sure that that's the case, at least with regard to large language models. Now, whether that will remain the case in the future is an open question. But the existing path is more characteristically, is more characterized by statistics and revenue generation than perhaps bots that will take this over, robots that will take this over. Okay. So what do we do now? What should we do? It's a good question. Here's my recommendation. I want you to expand your definition of human knowledge. I was in an interview on Friday where someone asks, asked me to differentiate human knowledge and artificial intelligence. And one of the things that I pointed out is that we human beings have intelligence that are not reducible to statistical predictability. And Christians actually know a lot about this. We could choose retribution, but we choose what instead? Forgiveness. Forgiveness, grace, compassion, love, loving kindness. We can just start listing out the fruits of the Spirit. Does that not count as knowledge? And is there a difference between a statistical model that can predict what it sounds like to extend grace versus the actual experience of knowing what grace feels like? Or what forgiveness feels like? Or what reconciliation feels like? Does that make sense? In other words, you can hear me saying re repeatedly over and over and over again that feeling matters. And feeling is a type of intelligence that a computer can't do. It can approximate what it sounds like given what human history has written about feelings, but computers don't feel. Does that make sense? And I want you to lean hard into that truth. Because as believers, that is what defines us. Great, or at least it should. Grace, forgiveness, compassion, love, hope, joy, peace. Yeah? Are these large language models, are they based solely in English, or are they doing other, I mean, that which will prejudice, I mean, a lot of things. And so are there, like, are there language groups that will never be the, the knowledge of these languages, very isolated language groups or small language groups, that will never be known in these larger models because they don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's a sense of, wow, when we talk about human knowledge that's accessible to us. The 
yeah. that these, those large language models, if they're based on maybe three or four of the predominant languages in the world, are going to be prejudiced. So I'm going to answer this. Uh, I'll answer this question in a way that will be very specific to you. So a couple of weeks ago, I, Mike and I talk a lot about books. We're pretty active readers. And I came to Mike a couple of weeks ago and I said, there's this book that you have to read. It was literally written for you. It's Babel. It's Babel by a writer named Carl Kwong. And the story of the book is essentially a story of linguistic imperialism, where the English is set in the like, 1840s, 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 1830s, yeah, the 19th century, right? So the whole goal of the empire is to own the rights to translation and basically extend one's economic dominion as a result. Remember what I told you earlier about a handful of companies owning the rights and having the ability to generate that? The large language models that they're developing are all in English. English is the base. And for anybody who pays attention to translation, you know that that has implications for how we think about the human experience, because the human experience is not reducible to English. So, it stands to reason that that would be another reason to be concerned, and another form of social policy and advocacy that we can you know, create. Now, having said that, again, the base being English notwithstanding, there are efforts to use these large language models to help translate across different multiple languages. So the company that I work with, their, their writing tool has, I think, nine or ten different languages associated, where you can write in mixed languages and it tries, does its best to translate into those particular issues. But it's translating into English, which might be no more than I do, that has significant implications yeah. for me. Okay. So, uh, expand your definition of human knowledge. Increase your language literacy. Okay? If we're studying large language models, the emphasis in that sentence should be language. You need to understand how language works and why it does what it does before you can get worried about a technology that utilizes the capacities of language to extend commercial or social um, domain. Does that make sense? Now, I realize in making this recommendation as a scholar of language, I'm going to be being a little bit prejudiced here. But, again, if we want to weigh into these debates, it's very important that you understand why your autocorrect doesn't work from a statistical perspective. It's also very important to know why hallucinations occur if you're per and what's the relationship between word and belief if you're going out into the world and bearing witness. Does that make sense? So we can become worried and preoccupied with the problem of certain kinds of technologies, but I actually think it's a subset of a larger language problem as a whole. And the good news for all of us is the Bible has a lot to say about how language functions. And that's Mike and Wes's job, so I'm going to leave it to them to kind of explain you how to do all that. Okay, increase your AI literacy. One of the things that I consistently say to my students is you need to know some about something. You need to know about where something has been before you can be confident about where it's going. You need to know, for example, why AI engineers moved toward the development of neural networks and what deep learning is. Anybody have a really confident sense of how that works? <laughs> Not so much, right? So if you really care about this topic, read A Brief History of Artificial Intelligence and it will give you very pithy, very uh, uh, helpful definitions about what the difference is between certain kinds of strategies with relationship to artificial intelligence. The more you read about that, the more you start to see that there are a lot of different kinds of perspectives. That a Michael Woolridge is not a Ray Kurzweil. That they have different relationships to things called the singularity, which would be the, the emergence of artificial general intelligence and effect, effectively the internet horizon for humanity with relationship to computer technologies. Uh, Ray Kurzweil is much more excited about that than others are. So, for one sort of learning history. Number two, read literature. If I'm an English professor, I'm going to tell you to read literature. It just kind of comes with cards. But there are a lot of really thoughtful novels about artificial intelligence and how they relate to humanity. My two favorite are actually written by two of my favorite authors. Um, Clara and the Sun, K-L-A-R-A -A and the Sun, by Katsuo Ishiguro. <coughs> That's the most recent one. And actually, a little-known novel by my very favorite author, Richard Powers, called Galatea 2.2. So both of those books are meditations. If you're worried about, well, how are human beings going to 
interface with these certain kinds of technologies, there are actually really brilliant writers who have engaged in thought experiments that capture the complex emotions that emerge in that space. So read that. I want you to, out of three, investigate options. One of the things that bothers me really consistently when people ask me about artificial intelligence and large language modeling is they say, what do you think about ChatGPT? Unfortunately, ChatGPT has become synonymous with generative AI and large language modeling because they were first to market, and that's okay. They're doing amazing work, and their, their engineers are absolutely brilliant. But there are a lot of other um, companies. There are more than just one company working on generative AI and large language modeling. I'll tell you just a little bit about the one that I'm working on, and you can kind of see the difference. So, um, ChatGPT does generative AI with whole, whole text construction. The company that I work with um, is called WordTune. The company is called AI21 Labs. The tool is called WordTune. It's actually really handy. Maybe you can sign up for a free account today. It's up to you, whatever. Um, but what it does is you can type a word, a sentence, or a paragraph into the search bar, hit enter, and what it will do, it will use the large language model to generate 10 to 15 different options about how the sentence, word, sentence, or paragraph could have been written. That's a funny... I think that's ours. Uh, more complicated, but yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. And so what it does is it basically puts you, as a writer, into decision-making mode. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, here are some options. Is this what you meant to say, or is this a better version of what you wanted to say? I don't know, I don't want AI doing that, except I studied it with my students this semester. And you know what it, they remark, like remarkably across the board said this? There are times when the technology offers me suggestions that I think that's better than I knew how to say it. And I chose to do that given the fact that it was consistent with audience, purpose, and situation. There are other times where the sentence was so bad, I was looking at it thinking, like, am I worried, like, why am I worried that you're going to take over the world? <laughs> This is not at all consistent with what I wanted to say. And then sometimes it will say, I looked at all of the options and decided, actually, none of these options are good and the option that I created isn't better, but I now know how to formulate it having considered these various options. In other words, it works like a thought partner as a technology. There are companies who use large language modeling and generative AI to help students develop literacy more effectively. And there are professors across the country who are being very thoughtful about how to incorporate such technologies so that students are able to rise to the challenge of whatever is happening on the horizon of our future. So when we talk about generative AI and when we talk about large language modeling, we need to realize that there's more than one way to do this work. And if we recognize that and we see that there are options, we can start to make decisions. We can promote certain kinds of values, we can promote certain kinds of social policies or regulations on the basis that there are already companies that are doing it successfully. And that makes a difference. We're not arguing into a vacuum, we're grounding our arguments in existing practice. Does that make sense? Okay, the last thing is you should play with these technologies. It goes back to the barbecue analogy. You learn a lot more about a technology when you actually have worked with it. You can say, wow, um, I'm not as concerned as I used to be because it created all of these sentences that are absolutely hallucinatory. And I know that I know more than this. There are other times where you can say, wow, this surprised me. And it puts you in a problem solving mode where you say, why did it surprise me? And what was my expectation going into this particular situation? But you can't do that unless you play. Okay, and then the last thing, and this uh, gets to Tomas's question he asked me, are you going to talk about um, the problem of humanity? And this is where uh, I'm most concerned. We need to realize that we are in an attention economy. We have created, we have turned our attention into a saleable commodity. Go onto YouTube, and you can see the statistics accumulating. If a video has 1.6 million likes, there's a number on the opposite end of that. We need to be very, very careful about how we engage with this particular kind of economy. Because if we don't understand the economy, then we're not going to understand the threat that generative AI poses. The attention economy preceded generative AI, at least as a public phenomenon. 
Does that make sense to everyone? And we have students, we have adults, we have children, knee high, sometimes older, who are preoccupied with engaging socially so that they become observable. And the research is showing over and over again that the more we become embroiled in this attention economy, the more isolated we become as humans, leading to things like early teenage suicide. It's leading to depression, anxiety, over-reliance on medication associated with those particular emotional um, diseases. And we have to remember that we have the ability to regulate that in our own lives. People will, are always surprised when I tell them that I'm not on social media at all. Yeah. I made an executive decision about I don't know, like five or six years ago where I'm like, I don't like the emotional effect that is, this is having, and I can see how it is influencing the way that I engage with other people. I start to see them as commodities, like, well, if I can get Wes to like my post, then I, by proxy, am valued more, and then I can go and then say uh, to Tomas, well, yeah, you're wrong, well, Wes like mine, what's wrong with you? And it becomes an exercise in one-upsmanship. And the, the consequence of that is, Wes feels cheapened. He's like, I gave you a thumbs up, but we didn't really have a conversation about it. There were things I liked about it, but in other words, what it does is it creates and fulfills expectations where we're saying, I am liked because my post was liked. That's not what's happening. Does that make sense? As believers, it is our responsibility to foster that connection. We have to recalibrate the attention economy, if not for ourselves, then for the wider world to act as a testimony where we say the thing that is most valuable is not whether or not I can turn someone's head. And if we are caught up in an economy that where we're consuming uh, certain kinds of technologies because they, uh, they're basically the, um, the intellectual equivalent of like a donut, we're like, yeah, it tastes good, but I feel like garbage. Sorry, I, if anybody really likes donuts, I apologize. I just don't feel great after I eat them, so it's apt for me. But um, I feel terrible the rest of the day. It's the same thing with the way that we consume headlines. It's the same, and that has implications for how we argue with one another. I've had more arguments with people that I would not otherwise have had conflict with because they were simply repeating with intensity the attention grabbing headline that was designed to count as a political stance when it was just a politically adjacent stance. If we don't understand that economy and we're not reasonably afraid of that economy, then large language modeling and generative AI is only going to make that a dissociative experience where we're like, I'm just afraid of everything. If you're serious about it, start understanding the role that language plays, the role that attention economy plays in framing these large language models, because I believe that those two issues are far bigger and far more challenging to solve than a statistical <coughs> algorithm that generates predictable words in fascinating and sometimes seemingly magical ways. We need to get right how we communicate with one another. We need to remember that humanity is organized around more than the capacity to remember and process. And that has absolutely nothing to do with generative AI. Does that make sense? All right. That's what I've got for you today. I talked way too long, but hopefully it was helpful for you. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, looks like we have a few. Um, will you moderate so I don't? Okay. Um, they already like you, so I don't want to have to fix it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, we're a little off our, our, our plans for today. Okay. Um, so I don't know if we want to have uh, Q&A now. We've already been at almost an hour. Or um, have a couple of comments that I wanted to bring to the conversation and then do our longer conversation. Oh, I really want you to be here in jail when we're going to talk about this. So we'll reschedule some stuff. Okay. Uh, let's go.
go ahead and do questions now. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to go a little longer than we anticipated. Is that okay? I apologize. I tend to speak way too long. Too, this is too urgent. Too, this is too important. The microphone is mostly for because we're recording this as well. This, so anybody, the people who missed it for today, so that's why we're, we're using it. Is that for you first? Yeah, we're not. How are you raising your daughters to address this? So you met my wife. Yes. She's the only. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, what was the question? He, the question was, how am I raising my daughters to address this? Um, first of all, how Yeah, my twins are 10, and my youngest is 8. Um, you know, it's a really complicated question. And I'll answer it probably in the same, with the same way that the advice that I just gave you a moment ago. We reduce that, we really restrict access. They, they have no access to social media. Um, we have really tight parameters about screen time. The times that they're using technology are often our learning engagements. Um, sorry, I'm aware. <coughs> Um, we spend a lot of time reading to them and insisting that they read. And we teach them how to deliberate by modeling what effective deliberation looks like to the extent that I'm, we can be successful at that. I think one of the things that's very important for you all to hear is as a professor of rhetoric, I talk a good game, but I fail really consistently. <coughs> All of those fruits of the spirit that we talk about, love, kind, kindness, patience, peace, you know, all of those things. If my wife was here, she'd say, yeah, he's really bad at that. <laughs> we're all working on that. And so I think <coughs> when I say we, what we're modeling, we model effective argumentation, but we also, as believers, model the active pursuit of grace and forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, and then I teach some stuff about rhetoric. As the case may be. So, there are a lot of kids in their age group that have cell phones that are already posting on social media. There is zero chance my daughters will have a cell phone until they start driving. And the only reason not have a cell phone is so that they can call me if they get an accident. Yeah. Good question. Um, these billions and billions of pieces of information yeah. that the large language models collect. Mm -hmm. How do they find it? How do they gather it? It's a good question. I mean, some of it is, I don't know the answer to that question, and that's something that I need to know the answer to. Um, some of it's just public information. Um, you know, if you state something publicly, you can be cited or studied or whatever the case may be. I think that uh, some of the companies probably have agreements, you know, like with the Oxford English Dictionary, I imagine that, that some of the companies have partnerships. Um, there's other kind of um, sources of concentrated material that tell us something meaningful about the evolution of language and how it works. Is it also the vast digitized database of It is, but some of that stuff is behind paywalls. That's why I, I, I'm hesitant to kind of say confidently how it works because there's a, you have to have access to it. So I'll find out about that. We've got one up here. Yeah. Isn't the uh, ultimate goal of the AI to modify your behavior. Behavior modification is, I think, a base of what I see from social marketing. I've sold a few companies in that. Mm -hmm. And I fear for what's going to happen in a year with the election and the hundreds of billions of dollars yeah. invested to modify each one of our behavior and our choice yeah. for leadership. I agree in principle with what you're saying. The only thing that I would I would argue is that if I would alter just a little bit because for me, like how you formulate sentences really matters as, as a writer and as as, some, as a rhetor. I don't think AI wants to modify our behaviors. I think the people who use or generate or circulate AI technology want to modify your behavior, and, the, and that the, that's the a difference. Generate the technology. Yeah, the people who the people who generate technology. And 
That's a slight difference, but it's a difference that makes all the difference because if you assign it to a technology that you never, like an algorithm that you never really see, that has implications for how you formulate social policy. But if you say, the companies who are developing artificial intelligence to modify behavior, that has a locatable target. You can say, I don't like that you are investing in developing algorithms that produce these kinds of effects in society and we're calling for regulation as a result. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that they can record my questions to the AI and so they know the characteristics of my behavior. That's true. Yeah. I mean, kind of. You're more complex than that. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, we haven't had a long conversation, I can already tell. <laughs> We've got one right here? Yeah. Okay, back when you were talking about the word tune, yeah. and you were using it as a positive thing that your students were changing up their first part of you know, their thinking. How do you know if a student is turning in a paper that they have used AI to create? And I'm afraid of it taking over creativity and journalism or any kind of writing or deep thought. How do you know? Um, well, that's a complicated question. Part of it has to do, like, there's there's going to be, I think, you're going to see increase and increase the amount of, like, what you might call, like, a digital watermark um, whenever something is generated through AI, um, especially in educational context. Again, that's predictive. I don't know, but there will also be companies that are, there are already companies, but there will be more, like, elaborate companies that are designed to catch auto-generated text, you know, text in a, let's say, academic essay. So as a director of private programs, that's something I'm charged with thinking very carefully about and trying to have good answers for. I actually would say, in the case of my own students who I asked to use those kinds of technologies, almost all of them also said pretty consistently, we don't want our own creativity to be co-opted by these technologies and knowing something about the history and being able to utilize them in a thoughtful way in an educational context actually helps us negotiate our relationship to them more effectively. Um, so I think it's really on educators to create the context for the responsible use of artificial intelligence so that there isn't a temptation to just auto-generate and have a good representative of voice. We have a question about what GPT-4 Okay. It's just, it's the thing that happened after GPT-3. It's the technology that we're talking about. It's, it's GPT, I'm, I'm being fluent. Uh, GPT-4 is just a more fluent version of uh, like generative AI. It's just far more fluent. It's faster, it's, it's more reliable, it reduces hallucinations. Can you define it? Can I have, you use hallucination, hallucinations? Uh -huh. uh, and I have not grasped what you mean. It, it, it generates a version of reality that is not rooted in reality, but it presents it as a bit work. Okay. So if I were to say, um, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson is the President of the United States in 2024, or 2023, that would be an example of a hallucination. Because we all know that Lyndon B. Johnson is not the President of the United States currently but it presents it as if that were the case. And you can imagine all sorts of really dangerous things that yeah. extend that logic. Which is the basis of a lot of persuasion. The war yeah. of liberation is a war of liberation. Yeah, but again, that, that's not a, that's why I'm saying we need to study language. That's yeah. not a GPT problem, that's a language problem. I want to take about five. Yeah, take it. Um, Please. Since you're, you're a little restless, but I also want to follow through on part of our promise early on, um, that was extraordinarily helpful today. We're going to have more meetings about all this. Um, what, 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 just some of you know, um, in a former life, I actually taught theology and technology. It was one of the topics that I taught when I was teaching in the school and at, at a college level. And a lot of that stuff, I just sort of, in terms of technological development, I just, like, left way behind. So this is extraordinary. And think of in multiple levels at once. I just bring it, probably emphasize it on the levels, bring some of the questions to it, and uh, in ways that I don't think you disagree with, I just might give some different emphases. Uh, but I think your example, and I, I, I want to, if you have a handout, so I want to explain that, um, but I'm listening to you, I've changed really what I wanted to say. 
Oh, sorry. Can you watch this? Um, but um, you totally put me off. Um, God, the no, the um, the little. If you've been to Tempe and you've seen, have you seen? Any of you seen the little uh, pizza delivery things on the campus? Right. It's a perfect example I want to talk about because I want to talk about emergent realities. And go back to a distinction in the history and the, and the theology of technology to use it, but I want to begin with these little pizza delivery things. The genius in developing these things, they made them cute, right? You see them, they're kind of cute. They look like little puppies wandering around the, you want to take care of them. Because they're, they're just sort of modeled, they're kind of goofy looking, right? And I was sitting at a coffee shop in Tempe, and one of them came by and got stuck on a chair. And everyone sat there watching it. And some of them wanted to say, is anyone going to help it? Is anyone going to help it? Because we thought it was in distress. You know, people around, because we want to live in a personalized universe. It's human. We want to live in relationship, to, even to things. And so we do anthropomorphize. We do attribute human realities and emotions to things. And we look at these little things. The reason why people are walking around to be kicking these things is because they're cute. And because they're cute, you don't want to hurt them. The person who would walk up to it and kick it over, we would call a sociopath. Even though it's just a machine, right? It's just delivering a pizza. But if you kick it over because it's cute, you attribute human emotions to that action, and you say, that's a cruel person who just kicked over this little thing. It's now going like this, trying to, <laughs> like, or, or, trying to turn itself over. Right? Because we do want, so I, I'm interested both in this distinction about that machine learning is not an intelligence. It's a form of processing, as you described. It doesn't have human experiences. But are we going to attribute humanity to it? Are we going to anthropomorphize this thing? How are we going to use it? There's a distinction in the theology of technology. It goes back to a um, French theologian, philosopher of technology named Jacques Boulle. It was picked up and used by several other thinkers, and that's between tool and technique. I have no worry whatsoever if Kyle Jensen's making decisions on how we use this technology. None whatsoever. Because for him, it's a tool. And you heard it in how he uses it, how he sees his students, how he talks about it, how he teaches his children, how I tried and failed with my own children. Right? Even we had we had dreams of we never let them see cartoons when they were young. We only watched real videos of real things. We like, didn't want the image to be larger than life until they developed a critical conscience on what an image is. So you begin with reality, not cartoonish reality. Cartoonish reality makes the image larger than life. Right? But we are now, we, we, we can make this into a cartoonish reality and lose critical consciousness over it. But that's part of what will happen in a commercial market. And the tool is something you can pick up and set down. I, for, the, for me, initially, this is becoming a technique. But this was a tool because I can remember life before it. Yeah. Some of you can remember life before typewriters, right? or at least before electric typewriters. We know life without it, therefore we use it to enhance the life we live and the life we know. But eventually, a tool which enhances things we already do eventually causes us to do different things. And the question then becomes, what of a generation, not my children, their children, but what becomes of the next generations of people or cultures in which this is not a tool, but a technique? It is the operating environment in which we live. When, when artificial intelligence and the many different forms of it, all the different forms, which you so helpfully help us remind us to know more, all the different forms of what we call artificial intelligence, which includes more than the machines. It includes all of the social, the labor, the economics, the attention economy, everything that surrounds these tools. When those tools become the very environment in which we live, and the environment in which our children grow, and they become how we understand ourselves, how we understand the cosmos, how we understand transcendence, how we simply how we understand. That's the question that the church needs to be absolutely, which you took us to in the end, absolutely has to be concerned about. We are being called to take place in civil society in, in taking actions to rightfully regulate this. 
But the larger question is what, is, what are the larger implications of our thinking about um, the one who knows us? You know, God knows me more than close, God is closer to me than He knows my thoughts before I think of them. I attribute that to a being who is who, who created me in love and knows me with grace and acceptance and wants me to flourish. When there is a machine that knows me I thinking before I think it, do I attribute goodwill to that machine, loving me as God loves me? How do I relate to that when it's when I don't know who's operating and who owns it? You know, I don't. It, we, we attribute these metaphors that we attribute to God to technology. But the technology to which we attribute these metaphors we attribute to God is not God. And so it just, it laid all kinds of, and that doesn't mean, that, you know, there, there are uh, groups, industry tech, you know, insiders, some of whom Kyle knows, um, people I haven't met but who are thinking critically about this. Um, this is a group that, I mean, I did hand this out because I didn't have fancy, uh, time for a PowerPoint, but you have this piece from um, a group called the um, uh, Future Light Institute, which is a lot of uh, technology industry insiders, closely related to another group I like a lot called the Center for Humane Technology, that did a lot of work around social media. Uh, and these were people who helped create social media and then became quite reflective on the technology they created. And said, we created technology without guardrails. We need to put the guardrails in place after the fact. They are now calling for, which it won't happen, but they're calling for a six-month pause on the development of, of, of these tools of machine learning um, in order to ask some basic social questions. I actually have a copy of their proposal. Um, and it's not the Center for um, Human Technology. They're in the circle. That the proposal comes from the Future of Life Institute. And they propose 11 things we need to think about um, economically, in terms of regulation, governmentally, some basic things we need, to make, we need to make decisions about now. Because in a culture of acceleration, these, um, unless there's some core questions we answer now, um, then they would suggest that we risk losing the possibility of using this technology as a tool. Uh, and we lose, we, we face um, considerable challenges if we don't address these questions now. I have copies of their proposal of what the questions are. I didn't make, I had I made 12 of them and a copy of them down. So there you go. So I have 12 of those uh, right here if anyone's really, really interested in seeing their proposal or getting the 11 questions. And an open letter. I just gave you. I'm not advocating it necessarily. Um, I signed it, but my signature doesn't matter. Um, but I want you to read it just to not get apocalyptic, not get frightened, but to, as Kyle said, know how what it is, but also how it's being talked about. Because I think that matters. Because this, you can't separate technology from how technology is received and used and received. Because that's part of the technology itself. This will change us. It will change the church, not because you know a machine can write my sermon for me. It'll change the church because it changes us. And we, the church historically, has always been deeply engaged with the development of technology. Uh, it is not the, the history of technology in the West cannot be understood separate from the church. Totally incomprehensible, separate from the church. Um, in fact, the uh, Ivan Illich, one of my teachers in this area, said that modern technology is rooted in medieval debates about the nature of the Eucharist. How the bread and the wine change in the Eucharist, that debate is essential to the history of modern technology. So I leave you with that. So that I do that. And, and then we can pick up more of this later. Opportunity 
as believers to bear witness as believers to those who are seeking truth. Think for a moment, if we, if we, we can think about the problem of hyper-personalization and auto-generated technologies as a source of fear, or we can see it as a source of inspiration. We can say, for example, that there are a ton of users who are deeply desiring to be known by something on a deeply personal level. And that desire is something that we can actually speak into and say, is this social media, does it actually know you? Uh, does this generative AI actually treat you like a person? And if you're finding yourself in a space where that's leaving you cold or leaving you hollow, there is an alternative to that. So the problem that we have faced is the problem that we're always facing, the desire to be known by a God who created us. And I want us as a church to speak into that, to leverage whatever knowledge we have about the technology to ensure that nobody feels lost, isolated, left, left in the ditch. As a per person. Perfect intro to Isaiah 44. Okay. I, was, I meant that. I meant it. You naturally meant it. This is Isaiah. This is Isaiah railing against idolatry. And it's all and it's all about the things we make. Isaiah 44. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witness neither they witnesses neither see nor know, so they will be put to shame. Who would fashion a god or cast an image that can do no good? Look, all its devotees shall be put to shame. The artisans too are merely human. Let them all assemble, let them stand up. They shall be terrified, they shall all be put to shame. The ironsmith fashions it and works it over the coals, shaping it with hammers and forging it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails and he drinks no water and is faint. It's a way of saying, we work so hard to create these things and yet we're human when we create them, right? We, we get tired. We grow faint, we get hungry, and we can't avoid that. The carpenter stretches a line, marks it out with a stylus, fashions it with planes, and marks it with a compass. He makes it in human form with human beauty to set it up in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or chooses a home tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it can be used as fuel, Part of it he takes to warm himself. He kindles a fire and makes bread. Then he makes a god and worships it, makes it a carved image and bows down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over half he roasts meat, barbecues, eats it and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, ah, I am warm, I can feel the fire. The rest of it he makes into a god. His idol bows down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, save me, you are my God. They do not know, nor do they comprehend, for their eyes are shut, so that they cannot see in their minds as well, so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. Now shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded mind led him astray. And he cannot say to himself, Is not this thing in my right hand a fraud? Isaiah is saying, You just made it five minutes ago. And now you're worshiping it like it's a god. As if you didn't make it yourself. As if somehow the thing we make, we, we attribute power to, Rather than, rather than retaining an awareness that the power comes from somewhere else and we must think critically about it. So the critical consciousness you're asking us to keep aware of is Isaiah right here. Not creating something and then saying, forgetting that we made it, right? And then giving it power that it doesn't have, which is the fear. Thank you. Um, should we talk again? Should we meet again about this? We picked you in for it, but I want Kyle here. So we're going to get back to you all about what day it's going to be.